Live from the Zoom Studios, the 17 and New Show, starring Ambassador Jeff Rivera, inviting you to join our special guest, Ed Ayers, author and Abraham Lincoln Award winner. And here we go! Welcome to the 17 and Me Show, the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals Show. Our special guest on tonight's show is Ed Ayers, the president of the University of Richmond and also the author of The Thin Light of Freedom. Can't wait to ask him a lot of questions about the Civil War and history. I remember when I was in a history class and I was asked, where was the Declaration of Independence signed? I told him that's easy, at the bottom. <laughs> Another time I was asked, did you know Abe Lincoln had to walk eight miles to school every day? I told him he should have stopped hitting that snooze button and caught the bus with the rest of us. <laughs> Another time I was asked, where did General Grant like to put his armies before a battle? I told him in his sleeves. Oh. All right, that's the last time I let you guys in for free. And finally, if two wrongs don't make a right, what do two rights make? A plane. <laughs> We're gonna have a really good show here tonight. We have president of the University of Richmond, Ed Ayers, and also talk about his new book, The Thin Light of Freedom. We'll see you back right after our sponsors. with goals of peace and sustainable development around the world their mission is huge but we're breaking it down in two minutes 17 sustainable development goals let's get to them because the more you know look in some corners of the world today people are living on a dollar a day hey that's not how it ought to be so go one eliminate poverty and go two Root out hunger across the globe There's 800 million people hungry if you wanna know Number three is health and well-being And getting people the health care that they need in Learning in school are the harder go for Education opens up minds and doors Goal number five is empower girls and women So they can have the same rights that men are given Number six, people need water that's clean Poor sanitation can't spread disease Carbon-free energy is goal number seven And how to achieve it is a question and it's pressing But if we put our minds together and work hard We can find a solution, I'm guessing 17 sustainable development goals To improve life all around the globe Protecting human health and the environment Whatever bad we make, we gon' have to lie in it 17 sustainable development goals To improve life all around the globe Protecting human health and the environment Whatever bad we make, we gon' have to lie in it Now imagine that you work all day for no pay Economic growth and decent work is goal eight Goal number nine is to foster innovation in infrastructure and industrialization Goal number ten, inequality reduction Eleven is sustainable city construction Twelve, well that's sustainable consumption So what we use matches up with production Goal thirteen calls for urgent action To combat climate change cause we know it's happening Fourteen, protect life under seas Fifteen, protect life on land Goal sixteen is for peace and justice all over the planet they're in high demand And the final goal Number 17 is the critical factor The heart of the machine It's the strength in the way We achieve these goals Of sustainable development Around the globe Yo. 17 sustainable development goals To improve life all around the globe Protecting human health and the environment Whatever bad we make We gon' have to lie in it 17 sustainable development goals To improve life all around the globe Protecting human health and the environment Whatever bad we make, we gon' have to lie in it
It's with great honor that I introduce our next guest, the president of the University of Richmond, Ed Ayers. In 2012, President Obama awarded Ed the National Humanities Medal. In 2018, Ed's book, The Thin Line of Freedom, which I have right here, won the Lincoln Award. In 2003, the Carnegie Foundation chose Ed as the Educator of the Year. And in 1993, Ed's book, The Promise of the New South, was a Pulitzer Prize finalist. Ed, how are you doing tonight? Doing great, thanks. I'm glad to be with you. Well, Ed, I'd like to lead off with what was the inspiration or the background that helped lift you to become the great author that you are? Well, if you told me when I was in high school that I would be a, a historian, I wouldn't have believed you. Uh, I'm sorry to say I wasn't interested in history at all. It seemed like something very distant from my life. Um, and even when I went to college, uh, I didn't study anything before 1900. I thought anything before that really couldn't be that relevant. I, I, was, I wanted to be a journalist is what I thought I wanted to do. And because I read my local newspaper and I thought it was fun <laughs> and that I, I liked writing. And, but then I got to, got to and, and I come from a home where people didn't really read books. Uh, it wasn't um, seen as really important or, or interesting. Um, and so that was another reason that I'm surprised that I have <laughs> written books. But um, so all my friends and I went off to the University of Tennessee, which was virtually free, uh, about 90 minutes from our house uh, in East Tennessee. And uh, I got there and I saw, wait a minute, there's a job where they pay you to talk and read books. All right. <laughs> I like this. <laughs> and decided almost immediately that being a college professor looked like a lot of fun. I kind of like it too because I'm sort of a showboat and I like the idea of people having to sit, come to a class several times a week and listen to me talk. So all that fit together. But um, even when I went to graduate, so I got through college as fast as I possibly could. I got through in three years um, and in ways that our children find impossible to imagine, got married immediately uh, at age 21 and um, didn't have a job. <laughs> My degree was in American studies and uh, we were in Upper East Tennessee. And, um, but I knew I wanted to go to graduate school and get a PhD for, cause that's what I needed to do to be a professor. And so, as you mentioned, I got into Yale much to my surprise and my wife and I went up there and I discovered I was a southerner now, this may strike you as amusing because you can probably hear my Southern accent, but at the, which is a, a particular variety of a Southern accent. This is a mountain accent, Appalachian or hillbilly, depending on how polite you want to be. Um, and um, when we got up to Connecticut, people pointed out that for the first time in my life, I had an ethnicity. <laughs> I was a Southerner, wasn't it? Just, just wasn't one, one more white guy uh, from East Tennessee. And uh, so... I started, you know, I was thinking a lot about my grandparents who lived on a farm way up in the mountains of North Carolina, uh, didn't have a television until I was 16, I didn't have a telephone until I was 16 years old. They did have a TV, they got one channel. Heated the house with a coal stove and, you know, she slaughtered my grandmother, four foot 10, slaughtered the hogs and, and killed the chickens and couldn't drive. So we would just be up there in the mountains for weeks <laughs> at a time. And I could see that history had happened. I could see that some time between my grandparents' lives, and she'd been born in that house in 1896, uh, that, and then my parents, who had moved an hour away, worked in factories, and then my mom became a school teacher. Um, and you know, we had a McDonald's, which was a big deal in 1962 <laughs> in, our, in our town in Tennessee. And I could see, okay, there's history that happens to everybody. History is not that stuff that I got out of the textbook at school where it's kind of a list of presidents and, you know, multiple choice tests at the end. Uh, history is the air we breathe. History is everybody. So I set out to write a kind of history that includes all kinds of people. And I wanted to include, um, you know, men and women, people of all ethnicities, the rich and poor. So that, that's kind of what I've been doing with my career. And people who've read Thin Light of Freedom can see that that book has 
enslaved people and free people and soldiers and civilians and deserters and heroes and North and South. And the idea is for all my books is try to show everybody that history is for everybody and that we're all in history every day and all the time. So that, that's what led me to write the books that I've read is if we couldn't write a history that was more welcoming and inclusive. Because I imagine that there are young people who can't see why we need to learn about all this stuff in the past. And I'm always assuming that they don't care and that my job is to persuade them to care and to show them. I wish I'd known earlier. It took me a long time to figure it out. Our research team took little time in finding out that you are the author of our history books, chapters four, five, eight, nine, and 12. Well, just so they believe that those are the best chapters. That's all I care. Well, I definitely wanted to highlight your book, The Thin Light of Freedom, The Civil War and Emancipation in the Heart of America. So, Ed, what was the motivation behind writing the book? And... Did you meet your expectations when it was all over? Well, you know, talk about fulfilling expectations. I, I'm, I'm going to pull the camera back and I need to start the story quite a ways back. So in the early, in the 1990, 1991, I was driving up the interstate highway in Virginia that uh, goes through the Shenandoah Valley. And people in California are gonna know about, obviously about the big valley that defines your state. The Shenandoah Valley is kind of like that in Virginia. But if you keep going up uh, I-81 in the Shenandoah Valley, it takes you into Pennsylvania and then into New York. And I was struck by how beautiful the valley is. But at this time, the United States had gone to war um, with Iraq uh, in the early 1990s. And I struck by how could it be that Americans could decide to kill each other in just six months? How could it be that the North and the South, and there in the Shenandoah Valley, it's not industrial versus agrarian, it's exactly the same. You cross the Mason-Dixon line, you can't see any difference. There was just one difference back at that time, is that below the Mason-Dixon line, there was slavery, and above it, there was not. So I set out the idea of what if we tried to understand the Civil War on the ground level, uh, on a human level, and that I gathered every piece of information about all the people who lived in a Southern place and all the people who lived in a Northern place. And this is where a big detour took place. Now, I had the idea of building this archive and sharing it with people so students like in high school could see where history comes from. It doesn't always come in a textbook, right? It's just raw material uh, and it's history is every piece of evidence of, about everything that happened before today. So there's a limitless amount of history, right? So we started thinking about how we would build that and share it. And back in those days, it would be floppy disks or something that your students can't even imagine. But then it, about 18 months after we started, a friend of mine called me to his office. He was in computer science. He says, hey, Ed, come here. There's something brand new. They're calling it the World Wide Web. And what this means is that we can build what they're calling a site and we could share all this information on this thing, this internet. So I know it's hard for your students to imagine that there was a time when the web didn't exist and we weren't sure that name was gonna stick cause it's kind of hard, World Wide Web, the three W's, right? So we built something called the Valley of the Shadow, which your students can still see Many millions of people have used it. It took us 14 years to put all that information about all those people online on the Valley of the Shadow. Then I came out to California and wrote volume one, which is called In the Presence of Mine Enemies. I was at Stanford and my job was to go to a Redwood room and not leave until I'd written a certain number of pages that day. <laughs> that was my job, but I did get to eat lunch and I discovered a California sport that I'd never played before, volleyball. At three o'clock, if I had written enough, I let myself go play volleyball uh, for an hour. And uh, I never got good, uh, but I always liked, you know, pretending I was. So I figured out, okay, I've got this website now, which has millions of pieces of evidence. 
how do I turn that into a book? And how do I write about the North and the South at the same time? And how do I include all the people? Well, it took me a long time. I wrote about 150 pages and then decided that it's doing it wrong. I just threw them away and started over again. So I wrote that book and it came out in 2003. And uh, it's the story of Thin Light of Freedom, but it go, starts with John Brown's raid in 1859 and goes up to the day before Gettysburg. And it looks when volume one ends for all the world like the Confederates are gonna win the Civil War. So it was a cliffhanger. Well, in the meantime, I was made Dean of Arts and Sciences at the University of Virginia. And then I became president at the University of Richmond. And you cannot write a book and do all the things that you have to do to be a president or a dean. So I just sat volume two aside for 14 years from 2013. Actually, it's only 12 because I started writing again in 2015. And so I went to the Valley of the Shadow and I picked up the story and I wrote The Thin Light of Freedom, which goes from the day before Gettysburg, overlaps just a few of the same quotes and takes us all the way through the end of the war into emancipation the end of, of the largest, most powerful system of slavery in the modern world, and the, through the creation of the most important amendments to the Constitution, the 14th and 15th Amendments of the Constitution. So your question was, did it live up to my expectations? Well, eventually, <laughs> but it took me a long time. And to give students an idea, just two counties, but you put those two books together and they're over 800 pages shows you how much we can learn about the people of the past, the letters and diaries, and how much we, could, we, we have the uh, letters from the largest group of United States colored troops, they were called, the black soldiers who fought to save the United States, the largest collection there, a diary of a, a husband and wife. He's on the front, she's at home, while their town is invaded by the enemy, things like that. So. The whole point of all of this, of volume one, was to explain how do America fall into a civil war that no one wanted. And volume two, the story is how did the largest, most powerful system of slavery in the modern world come to an end when nobody four years earlier had imagined that was possible? And then how did the greatest experiment in democracy in American history of emancipation and reconstruction, how was that put in place and what did it mean for black people who had been in slavery and then made themselves free. So those are, it's the big themes, but the big themes that are not about Abraham Lincoln or, you know, William T. Sherman, they're about people like us, about people to whom history happens, people who find themselves in history. People maybe think about, well, COVID happened to us, right? We, we, we were minding our own business and suddenly we had to adjust our lives to it. Well, the Civil War was like that for most people. They didn't start it, but it descended on them. And the question then is, how do you live? What choices do you make? You know, we've seen in our own time, do you wear the mask or not, right? Do you maintain the distancing or not? People then had to decide, I'm in slavery. Do I escape as soon as the United States Army is nearby? Uh, do I go off and try to find my son who was sold away from me two years ago? Or do I wait and see if maybe he'll come to me when the war is over? So all, all these decisions. So in all these ways, I try to write history in which people can see themselves and make people today realize that they had no idea the Civil War was coming or how it was going to turn out or if they were going to make it through. And we don't have any idea today how our own history is gonna turn out. One thing I point out is that living through history is a poor way of understanding it. <laughs> you know, we don't really know what's happening to us, right? We don't know how the story is gonna end. Is the story gonna end with uh, the world gathering itself to create these vaccines and we're able to put it out? Or is this virus gonna endure? for five or 10 years or even longer. What difference is it gonna to make to the life chances of young people like, like your students who've had to be in distance learning? Is that gonna be something that's gonna have an impact the rest of their lives? So I write all this history in many ways for people to think about it as a metaphor for ourselves, okay? We, 
we can be morally superior to all the people of the past. They're dead and they can't fight back, right? But instead, I like people to imagine, what will people say about us 100 years from now? How did, how did we respond to the challenges of our own time? So that's why I write history um, is to help the future, not to try to fix the past. One thing I ask people to think about is what will your grandkids or great grandkids call you out in, in 25 to 50 years? It's easy for us to talk about slavery, the inhumanity of it, the practices that were going on quite a long time ago. But what are we doing today? The practices that we use, the practices we go by, how will they be called out? For instance, if you watch Star Trek, the food replicator, when they're making up their own foods without the mistreatment of animals, they question how could those people back then treat their animals so inhumanely? You can go back a little over 100 years ago with Upton Sinclair when he wrote the book, The Jungle. Some of the things that were going on in the slaughterhouses, people were getting sick and dying from what was going on. Only the USDA and po policies created the stoppage of what was going on back then. So that's one thing I, I basically enjoy asking people to come up with, what are we gonna get called out on? Because that's how, in my opinion, we, we improve ourselves as a civilization. I use that same example I, because, it, because I'm not a vegetarian, but we have all the information we need to know the pain and suffering and waste that that causes, but we don't do anything about it. I use that to explain why didn't people stop slavery, right? They had the information, the white people, to understand the suffering when people were bought and sold, but they couldn't imagine that they could do anything about it, right? In the same way, we can't imagine that we could just stop eating meat, but we can easily imagine in 50 years that we won't. <laughs> and, you know, the other example that I use is that people are going to be appalled in future generations that we have just people homeless. Didn't your society have enough money to take care of the people who? And so that's a great example that I, it's interesting that we use exactly the same one about slaughterhouses and about the suffering that we inflict. Uh, because it's not just a matter of information, it's a matter of what seems feasible. But what's interesting is how quickly things can change to seem feasible. And you know, the one lesson I always teach my students is things that are much worse than we can imagine can happen. And things that are much better than we can imagine can happen. So I was born in the segregated South. I grew up where things were labeled Negro and white and watched that system of segregation be destroyed by brave black people who put their lives on the line to protest it, right? And then to enlist the federal government to doing this. So I've seen things that when I was a young child just seemed natural, you know, that black people and white people are gonna be segregated at the movie theater or at a restaurant or in school. I went to segregated schools. Uh, and to see that change should be an inspiration to students today. They can make big changes and young people can play major roles in doing that. So it's interesting that you and I use the same example for the same purpose. So I'm glad I'm, I'm with the program there. I, I'm really looking forward to the food replicator because I can imagine punching in a couple numbers and getting exactly what I want to eat. Yeah, well, you know, I'm, I'm also waiting for the teleporter, you know, that would be convenient too. I'm a big fan of Star Trek, especially the first season. Uh, I, I kind of lost track when I got older, but uh, I, I can tell you about all the episodes with Spock and Kirk and so forth. And they had the replicator there, so we're, we're, we're on the same page. There was a 12 year gap between your first book and your second book. I'm sure technology had a big role to play in your second book. Can you describe some of the impact that technology had on your second book? How much easier was it to come by information? Yeah, I want to be really clear. It didn't take me 12 years. I just waited 12 years. <laughs> because I don't want to discourage people from writing books. Writing is so much fun. I love it. I'm writing a book right now, in fact. And uh, it is, you have to be patient but it's like putting together the world's largest jigsaw puzzle, except you get to make the pieces, right? 
It's great. So I love that. So, so I, I, as I mentioned, we actually kind of invented uh, what we call digital history in the very early 90s. So you, your students, look at Valley of the Shadow, can go, and it's valley.lib.virginia.edu, but if you just search Valley of the Shadow, it turns up very near the top of the list. And uh, every source that I use in Thin Light of Freedom is there. And I think that um, the book would have been impossible without technology. But when you read the book, it's meant to read as much like a novel as I can make it. So what this shows us is that technology is not the enemy of writing, but it can be an ally of writing. So just this afternoon, so I'm writing right now about 1832 and 1833 and the um, displacement, dispossession of American Indians. Um, and I'm thinking now about the area from St. Louis West and uh, so I was reading, there's a famous author, Washington Irving. People may know the story of Rip Van Winkle, right? Or Ichabod Crane, right? Well, he, come, he goes away to England for 17 years and comes back. And what he wants to see, he rides out for two months uh, on horseback to, to meet the American Indians. Uh, and so I was wondering, gosh, I wish I had a copy of his book. I go online and my library has it. And there it is. And so... You know, the books, I'm, I'm, I'm reading many, many, many books right now. And uh, I've come to the point now where I'm a little surprised if I don't find an electronic version of it. So, but here's the thing. The students today live in a vast archive. Now, I'm a big fan of popular music. Um, and so for me to be able to go back and see, like last week, I'd read a story about Dusty Springfield uh, had a show in 1965 where she invited all the stars of Motown to England. And so she sings with the Marvelettes. And I, I read about that. But then I go on my phone and there it is for 1965. So in many ways, our students today live in a perpetual past. They can see any part of the past, which is something was impossible even five years ago. Yeah, so this is going to be on YouTube. But YouTube is a vast archive. And so that in some ways, you know, during the, the coronavirus, notice the office and friends are on all the time, right? So we watched those when they first came out, when, when they were new shows, but now they're perpetually on. So what do students and historians today do when there's way too much evidence? Back in the day, we thought that the, the job of a historian was to go out and to collect as many note cards as possible, right? <laughs> to, to gather them up and put them in storage. But now the note cards are instantly there. The problem is how do we give it shape and form? And so technology has changed things by enabling new kinds of research, but it's also given us new kinds of challenges of how do we write when there's too much information. And in some ways, Thin Light of Freedom shows even if you're just writing about two places, it still takes me 500 pages to describe what happened to just those people. At this time, there are 2,500 counties in America at the time of the Civil War. Imagine all the stories that are there. So I think this is an exciting time uh, for students to confront history, uh, that they can see the raw materials of it. They don't just have to take historians' words for it, even in my excellent textbook, uh, but they can, they can push through and see the evidence for themselves. And I encourage students to do that. We're gonna take a commercial break and hear from New American History. If, if you're gonna show something, what I really wish is that you go to newamericanhistory.org, uh, which is the new project that I'm leading up. And there's two big things in there that are great. One is called Bunk, which is named after the Henry Ford quote, the history is more or less bunk. The only history that matters at Tinker's Dam is the history we make today. Every day we curate the way that people are using history to entertain or explain ourselves. So we'll, I'm sure I haven't looked, but I'm sure if you tap, typed in Star Trek, <laughs> you're gonna find there's 6,000 articles. And the point of all that is to show students that history is alive. People are using it all the time to sell them something, to persuade them of something, right? Um, 
And the other thing is American Panorama, the digital atlas of American history. And I'd encourage you to go to foreign born population. You can click on any county in the United States between 1850 and today, and it will send tendrils out to all the countries in the world from which the people in that county were born. And you can watch. And, and so it's got all kinds of wonderful things like that, American Panorama and Bunk on New American History. And so your question about technology is that we're trying to use the newest technology that and take advantage of all the computing power on our cell phones that people can actually see complex visualization. So we're trying to use technology in new ways. So maybe that's not actually an ad. Maybe this is actually part of our conversation. Um, and because I, I feel like I love writing, but also love imagining the new ways we might be able to see history uh, in all this new technology that's around us and the way that you're doing with the, this YouTube series, which I'm happy to be a part of. Well, welcome back from our commercial break. This is my favorite part of the show where I get to ask our guest. In this case, it's Ed Ayers, who wrote the book, The Thin Light of Freedom. Ed, what is your favorite SDG and what's the passion behind it? Yeah, I hate to be predictable, but I've spent my entire life in education. And I decided early on that education is the key to everything else. All the other challenges and goals that you have there are going to be enabled by people knowing what they're doing and by people discovering new ways of doing things. And what role would history have in all that? To see all the ways that we failed in the past, to see what succeeded, who actually in the past made things better. So my book is called The Thin Light of Freedom because it is about people with nothing but the shirts on their back, people have been in slavery, making new lives for themselves. You know, we, we think about the challenges in our own time, but the challenges of coming out of perpetual bondage and having been separated from your family through sale is as big a challenge as we've had in American history. So I mean for this to be inspiring. Every generation of Americans uh, has confronted challenges that seemed overwhelming at the time. And ours seem overwhelming now of climate change and of the quality of our environment and of the way that we snipe against each other. All, none of those things are new. It, it's taken us a long time to get here. But if we're gonna find a way forward, we have to some, have some idea of where we are. And there's only one way of knowing where we are. And that's through history. That's the only way of locating ourselves in time. One thing I say is that if we were as lost in space as we are in time, we would freak out. If we didn't have any idea of where we lived in California or Virginia, we would feel completely disoriented. But we really don't understand where we are in time. Are, you know, are we at the beginning of the end? Uh, are, are there great new possibilities before us? Or is this the beginning of a long-term decline? Have people before confronted these kinds of things? History is the only way that we know. So I think of history as a kind of a geography of time is the way that I think about it. And when people look at American Panorama Project I oversee, they'll see we're trying to show space and time of change, how America has constantly changed. So I've studied history for 40 years now and I've only been able to find one rule, what people expect to happen never does. What does that mean? That creates space for young people to make history follow the shape they want it to follow. History is more, more plastic, more pliable than we sometimes imagine. But the history that really matters is the history before us, not the history behind us. But it's only the history behind us that can give us any idea of how it might go forward. So quality education. And what do I mean by that? Education starts a moment of our birth. And so even though I've spent my life teaching college students, I think in many ways, children who are three and four and five years old are the place we need to make sure that they get a chance to use all the rest of the education that we offer. So there's no more important job than teachers. No more important jobs from every level 
And uh, so the more I talk, the more I believe that that is my choice of your 17, is that education for everyone of the highest quality, taught with humanity and humility, knowing that the people behind us are, have, are gonna be entrusted with the future is the most important thing we have. I was thinking also with the, some of the uh, goals, environmentally, the Civil War was, would be devastating to these 17 goals because no poverty is one, zero hunger is two, good health is three, and obviously they didn't have the food, so there was all type of people probably dying from different ailments because of those situations. Oh, yeah. there, was, there was no quality education. Uh, there was no gender equality. Women couldn't vote at that time. And then w the devastation they were doing to the earth, especially with the scorch, uh, scorch earth policy, it must have been horrific environmentally. Oh, it's heartbreaking to read all of this, actually. Uh, everything you just said is true. But they would, and think about this, what drove these armies? Animals. So we don't ever see paintings of this, but there would be herds of thousands and thousands of pigs and, and, and cows that were driven along with the armies because there's no refrigeration. And so they basically had to, take us back to the slaughterhouse metaphor you used before, they actually had to drive their food with them. But that food ate the same food that they did <laughs> of, of wheat and oats and so forth. And so the, if we imagine just the environmental devastation of an army of 70,000 men and all those livestock being driven through your farm, a work of a lifetime can be destroyed in a morning. They would take the, the fences or wooden fences to use that to build the fires, the only way they would stay warm at night. They would cut down the entire forest to use for fuel, but also to build barricades and so forth. So the devastation here in Virginia in particular, where so many of the battles took place, uh, you can still see the earthworks. You can still, still see the devastation of the landscape. So the, and you pointed about disease. Imagine this, they had no idea about germ theory. They had no antibiotics. And so the people who died in the war were more likely to die of disease than they were being wounded. And think about this, the people who were most likely to die were younger people who had been exposed. So today, you know, kids know they're gonna to have to get measles or smallpox, chicken pox. Back then, those would have killed you because there's no immunization for it and no treatment of it. So, you know, one thing I often say is that nothing like studying the past for a living to make you glad you live in the present. I'm not nostalgic for anything in the past. <laughs> I don't see any way that the past was better than today. And especially if you're a person of color or you're a, a a female, you know, or if, if you're a person uh, who is, doesn't fit into any of these categories, the past was, we're, we're making progress on, on some fronts. We're in a race against time now in the environment because we have means, greater means to harm the environment than we had before. Um, I'm afraid to say that humans have never shown concern for the environment they should. I don't know that we're worse, just that we have more powerful weapons now to destroy the earth. We can't end on a discouraging thing like that. So ask me a question that has an optimistic answer, Jeff. Well, as you know, Ed, when you're talking history, sometimes you talk about mistakes, bad things, and sometimes you talk about achievement, good things. So let's talk good right here. Let's bring up what words of encouragement, advice, or words of wisdom that you have for our audience and students, something that would be uplifting for them to march forward in their future. I've given a lot of commencement speeches, right? And, and the temptation there is always to give, you know, some kind of, you know, easily containable <laughs> piece of advice. 
but you know, I've taught lots of young people and I would say that people need to give themselves a break, okay? You don't know when you're 18 what you're gonna do with the rest of your life and you don't have to know. But what you want to do is keep as many options open for yourself as you can. Okay? So that means get as much education as you can whatever it might be that you're interested in that you think is useful, but don't stop. Keep that, keep that option open. You also want to be sure that regret is one a heavy burden to, to carry through the rest of your life. If you are kind to everyone, you don't give yourself things to regret. If you're cruel to people, whoever they might be, you'll remember it. And it diminishes you. So you, being kind is not a weakness. So those are two unrelated pieces of, of advice, though, that I, I've discovered in teaching many young people over a long time and talking to them decades later, right? I'm so glad I took that class because it showed me that I could write. Or I, I'm glad I understood that about science because I really need to understand if I'm going to live in the world, how the world works but also find that people say, you know, I really wish that I had not said that thing to that person. I wish I'd not taken that opportunity to gang up on somebody who was kind of an outsider. I wish that I had not made fun of somebody, you know? And it's surprising how it's not merely the recipients of lack of kindness who remember it, but it's the people who are unkind themselves. So keep your options open and be kind to everyone is those are my two pieces of advice. Well, Ed, can I ask you to leave off with a history story from one of your books or some research that you've done that leaves us on a positive note? Is there a story or an example, an event that you would be able to share with our audience that was uplifting and very inspirational to you? Thin Light of Freedom ends with a story of a young man who was 13 when the Civil War begins. And he's in slavery. And his father is uh, sent to dig uh, trenches uh, for the Confederacy outside of Richmond. So his mother has to raise him and, and he dies of pneumonia as so many enslaved men did who were put in that very hard work. And so here he is 13 years old without a father in slavery, in the Civil War. At the end of it, he determines that he wants to be a teacher. And so he goes to a brand new schools that are created by the Freedmen's Bureau right after the Civil War. Uh, and in that school, he also meets young black teachers who, are, uh, who have taught themselves to read even though that was illegal under slavery and they teach him to read. And he falls in love with that idea. But he wants to go to college, but he doesn't have any money, of course. And so he goes up into the mountains where there are new resorts uh, for white people, uh, that trains are bringing them down to, to uh, and I know in California you have the kind of lodges, right? And those kinds of things. Well, they were having those in the mountains of Virginia and West Virginia. He's a waiter and he works hard and saves his money. And then he goes to Washington, D.C. Uh, and studies uh, to become a teacher. And he comes back home. Uh, to, this is to Stanton, Virginia. He starts a school. He meets a beautiful young woman who's also a teacher, who's about the same age, who's also uh, used the schools of the Freedmen's Bureau. Uh, and they, they teach a school together. And, but he also then edits a newspaper and he also runs for political office and he hosts meetings of all the other black teachers in Virginia who come to his town and they have a conference about how they can teach all the young people around them. And so literally out of nothing, this young man makes a life in which he enriches the lives of lots of other people. He is brave. 
This is not a time when black people were encouraged to vote or start newspapers. Uh, and he does it anyway. And what was the key for it? The key was education. And he knew that. But, you know, people often say that Reconstruction was a failure. Well, if we look at it from the viewpoint of people coming out of slavery, they took Reconstruction and used it to build new lives for themselves. So the thin light of freedom, he can see that thin light. He pursues it. And he knows that that light comes from education and it comes from self-reliance, comes from family, comes from his religious faith, and it comes through teaching school. Of all the things that he can do, he runs a school. So that's the most inspiring story I've seen, somebody coming out of every disadvantage that American history has offered and seizes that opportunity to make a new life for himself and for his family. For roughly a year, I've taken my kids to a Civil Wars Day where they have reenactments. And I remember the first time I took my children on a Saturday, there was a cannons and they actually do the reenactment with cannons going off. And the first cannon that went off was extremely loud. It made it feel like the earth shake. And I remember both my kids who were very young at the time, ran over, jumped in my lap. And I remember my daughter saying, dad, I think the earth just cracked. It was uh, amazing the impact that these cannons had. Yeah, oh, that's great. You know, well, imagine at Gettysburg, a thousand of those without stopping all day long. So that's where example of hearing one is it allows us to maybe imagine what it would be like to do all that. So, uh, yeah, I think that museums and visiting places are so important. Uh, I have had a chance to speak in Redlands uh, at the Lincoln Shrine there in California. And uh, the uh, seeing the way that people are keeping alive uh, this material memory of the war is important. So I appreciate you sh sharing that story. Just ask your kids to imagine listening to that for 14 hours and, and people are shooting at you. <laughs> uh, it, it's hard to imagine. I, I think that people really can't, that we've kind of cleaned up the Civil War a little bit too much. Uh, we, we tend to forget that if we had it today, it'd be the equivalent of 8 million people killed as a share of the population. And uh, you know, people today worry about our politics and have we ever been this divided? And I said, yeah, compared to the mid 19th century, uh, this is just talk. Um, but we need to remember, nobody saw the Civil War coming either, right? So talk sometimes can lead uh, to harder things. And so that's the reason we need to talk in better tones to each other, right? Or we'll be hearing more of those canons that you heard one question I have to ask you is, have you ever been to Yosemite National Park? It's one of my favorite places to go and love taking people on field trips there. It is the most beautiful place. Yeah, we have picked, I, our kids just a little bit older when we took them there and we have the pictures. Uh, and, you know, so we drove from Virginia to California uh, back when we were in, in Palo Alto and uh, went out of our way to come to Yosemite. Having a chance to live there, man, what a what a treat, it must be inspiring every day. Well, the central San Joaquin Valley is the breadbasket to the world, but we've even had some of our environmental mistakes here as well. The gold dredging that was done somewhere around the Sonora area devastated the uh, farmland in the pursuit of gold, which devastated the uh, ground and it's nothing but rocks. And I just don't see anything happening there for quite a long time. Things are taken, they can't be put back, that's right. You know, one of the most powerful places I've visited in California, and I, I will recommend this to you, uh, I've hosted a television series that you can get online called The Future of America's Past, and where we visit places where uh, historians, park rangers, and uh, local citizens are wrestling with things that have happened in American history. And we visit Manzanar, uh, the Japanese American incarceration camp uh, and talk to the people there. And we talked to a woman who, when she was in her early teens, was the songbird of Manzanar. 
and we visited her at her home in Los Angeles today. She's 95 years old or something. And for her to remember what it was like, you know, to be to suddenly taken from your home, taken to this concentration camp and put it in, uh, was very powerful. Your students get a chance to go to Manzanar. Uh, that's, I know California's a big state. I know that's far away, but it's still, reminds us not only what we can do to the environment, but what we can do to each other. <laughs> and, and maybe in this time when we're concerned about the injustices that Asian Americans are experiencing, uh, if you can't go to Manzanar, at least watch that episode of the future of America's past. Uh, we, we, we have another episode about the Transcontinental Railroad, where I talk with a woman who is the descendant of one of the Chinese laborers who built the railroad. And now she leads a historical society. Uh, and there I also talk with the Shoshone uh, leader who remembers from his people. So those TV shows are only half hour. Um, you can see them through New American History as well. Uh, are places that show how all across the country, there are excellent people who are helping us understand the things that had happened to the past. And so we're, we're kind of going there and introducing them. Uh, th those people who, what we call, they're on the front lines of American history. Um, and so if your students are curious about some of the other things in California, uh, they can perhaps uh, uh, look at the future of America's past and see uh, what those places look like. Our Merced County Fairgrounds has a monument out there recognizing the Japanese people that were removed from their land here and uh, put into internment camps. Uh, the fairgrounds was used as a stage one facility. And uh, we have some good stories that came out of it, uh, more bad than good, but there was a few instances where neighbors actually kept Japanese Americans farms going, paid the taxes on it. So that way, when they were finally released, they had a home to come home to. Unfortunately, that was rare, but it did happen. Well you know, we're so fortunate to live in such a beautiful country, and I'm confident that we're going to rise the challenge of preserving it better than we have, you know. I, I really do believe that, you know, the new generations are going to um, be able to rectify uh, some of the mistakes that we've made, but also to remember, you know, Yosemite is there because of environmentalists who came and protected it, right? And because of the federal government that protected it. So we need to remember that good things can happen, uh, but we just have to be alert to them and know what to value. But it, uh, living in California, the Central Valley, you know, sort of feeding much of the country, thanks for that, we appreciate it. Uh, you know, what, what a, what a, uh, uh, Well, it's time for one more commercial break. It's the future of America's past. I've taught history for 40 years, written books, launched a museum and a podcast. I've learned history isn't only found in archives. No matter where I go, I see park rangers, curators and activists reshaping how we understand the past. That's what I'm talking about. That's why we preserve these great spaces. Join me and let's discover the future of America. Sometime as a historian, and you'll probably agree with this, is that you have to talk about the good along with the bad. It's not one or the other. And a lot of times people that uh, are patriotic have an issue with you bringing up the negative things that the country's done. And sometimes they tell you that you don't love America. But what I try to explain to them is that when you have a problem or you've done something wrong, until you have apologize for it or until you have recognized what you've done wrong and try to make amends for it, that you're going to continue to make that same problem. So you love your country when you don't want your country to the do future. wrong again. Yeah. If you love America, tell the truth about America. The people you love, you don't lie to, right? You, you tell them what they need to know. Hey, you know, don't want to do that again, right? Uh, if you love the country, you don't need to um, look past the, the errors, but also some of the sins that we've committed, right? Um, so I, I think the idea that to love the country, you have to have blind loyalty actually violates the fundamental principles of America. <laughs> the whole idea of America is we have freedom of, of speech, freedom of the press. 
those are there for a reason. They're to say things that will make us better by being honest with us. And what's amazing, too, is that people who suffered that still love America, you know. And uh, so I think, you know, as people think about uh, are the wounds of the past ever heal, uh, I think there are people, the people held in slavery, you know, will then fight for the United States. The people who were incarcerated will love the United States. I think if people would understand all the different kinds of people it's taken to create this country, we'd be a lot better off. Um, you know, we're all real Americans. I don't care how long you've been here. I don't care what the background is. If you're here now, you're American and the country's in your, in your hands. So I think that um, there are inspiring stories from the past as well as warnings from the past. I think it's good as you're doing to help us. Well, speaking of freedom of speech, I want to thank you for sharing with us today your thoughts and motivations behind the thin light of freedom. I really appreciate you sharing uh, your love for history and your love for our country. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I appreciate it. Good luck. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for writing our, our, our uh, book in our classroom. And <laughs> You're welcome. Thank you. thank you for watching our show tonight. If you'd like to learn more about the 17 SDGs or you'd like to teach it in your classroom, please go to teachsdgs.org. Thank you for watching. I look forward to seeing you on our next episode of 17 and Me.